Hello there. I'd like to take this time to invite you and your family to join me for the next half hour as we read, we discuss, and we meditate upon the Word of God together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And those ageless and enduring lyrics were written by an Anglican minister who at one time had been a slave ship master, and his name was John Newton. The author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, and for the first 23 of the 82 years he lived, he insisted that he do it his way and his way only. And his way included many religious taboos such as profanity, gambling, and drinking. But the one thing that he regretted most of all was his involvement in slave trading. But then something happened. Something happened to him on May 12th in the year 1748, for it was on that date that he was returning to England aboard a slave trading ship called Greyhound when the ship and crew encountered a severe storm which threatened to overwhelm them. And John Newton awoke in the middle of the night and as the vessel filled with water, he suddenly found it necessary for him to pray to God for mercy. And he said the Lord's Prayer. And it was this experience which he was later to mark as the beginning of his conversion to Christianity. And in 1757, he applied for the Anglican priesthood and on the 29th of April in the year 1764, John Newton received deacon's orders and finally became a priest on the 17th of June in the year 1764. Now it must be said that John Newton has been criticized by some modern writers for continuing to participate in the slave trade while at the same time holding to strong Christian convictions. This has often been characterized as hypocrisy. And John Newton wrote, I was greatly deficient in many respects. I cannot consider myself to have been a believer till a considerable time afterwards, after what he felt was his true conversion to Christianity. He came to deeply regret and repent of his personal involvement in the slave trade. And he later joined William Wilberforce in the campaign for abolition. And in 1787, he wrote a booklet supporting the campaign, Thoughts Upon the African Trade. And among his greatest contributions to history was his encouraging William Wilberforce in the campaign for abolition to stay in Parliament and to serve God where he was rather than to enter into the ministry. And Wilberforce heeded the ex-slave ship captain's advice and spent the next five decades working for the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire. Now, William Wilberforce was born the son of a wealthy merchant, and at the age of 21, he was elected a member of parliament, and, is, and this is thought to have been the beginning of Wilberforce's spiritual journey, and he began to rise early to read the Bible and pray, as well as to keep a personal private journal. 
He resolved to commit his future life and work wholly in the service of God. And one of the people he sought guidance from was John Newton, the former slave trader. And after months of planning, on May 12th in the year 1789, he made his first major speech on the subject of abolition in the House of Commons. And for the next 44 years, he worked tirelessly to make his dream come true. And on July 26 in 1833, he heard and rejoiced at the news that the bill for the abolition of slavery had finally passed its third reading in the Commons. And on the following day, he grew much weaker and died early in the morning of July 29th. One month later, Parliament passed the Slavery Abolition Act, which gave all slaves in the British Empire their freedom. Now, you may say that William Wilberforce's way of resolving the slave trading issue was slow and methodical in nature, but it was the correct way of doing it. For as William Shakespeare said, the better part of valor is discretion. William Wilberforce's solution to ending slavery was quite different than that of an, ab of an abolitionist who in 1859 was the first white American abolitionist to advocate and practice insurrection as a means to abolish slavery. And President Abraham Lincoln said he was a misguided fanatic. His attempt to start a liberation movement among enslaved blacks in Harper's Ferry, Virginia in 1859 electrified the nation even though not a single slave answered his call. And John Brown was captured, tried for treason, and hanged. And historians agree that the Harper's Ferry Raid in 1859 escalated tensions that a year later led to the beginning of the American Civil War. And both John Brown and William Wilberforce were men who wanted to stop the practice of slavery, but each man's solution to stopping the practice of slavery was entirely different from the other man's way of thinking. And just as John Newton was a proponent of the practice of slavery for the first 23 years of his life, until the Lord revealed unto him that slavery was not in his divine plan for one man to impose on another man. And once this truth is revealed unto you, then it's important that you do the right thing or your indecision in not correcting your mistake will result in you committing a sin. For we are told in the fourth chapter of St. James and the 17th verse, as well as the eighth chapter of St. John and the 32nd verse. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And once that event takes place in your life, you will be able to say with boldness and confidence a statement which is also the title of my sermon. I was blind, but now I see. But unfortunately for many people, they don't realize the folly of their actions and decisions until it's too late. For in the fourth chapter of Proverbs, in the 12th verse, it says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. What does one do when you find yourself confronted 
with life-altering decisions that you must make? Well, the answer may be found in the 90th Psalm and the 10th verse, and the 39th Psalm and the 4th through the 13th verse. Seventy years are given to us. Some may even reach 80. But even the best of these years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we are gone. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth for someone else to spend. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. And hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cries for help. Don't ignore my tears, for I am your guest, a traveler passing through as my ancestors were before me. Spare me so I can smile again before I am gone and exist no more. And through his words, the psalmist is echoing a divine truth that God made us and, ex and we exist only because God wills that we exist. And each and every one of us was made by God for God. And until we come to that realization, our life will never make sense. For life is about letting God use us for his purposes and not us using God for our own purposes and not us using God for our own purposes and our own private agendas. And when we allow the Spirit of Christ to permeate and take over our life, then we will have the Spirit that Jesus Christ had of having God's purpose for our life the central theme of it. For all that we do in life, it must be done for the glory of God. And in so doing, we, like Jesus Christ, will receive our just reward. And in the 17th chapter of St. John, and the first through the fifth verse, we are given a glimpse of the special relationship Jesus had with his heavenly Father. For it says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone in all the earth. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by doing everything that you told me to do. And now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. And it was Jesus' unwavering commitment in doing God's will for his life that enabled him not to deviate from the divine purpose God had sent him to accomplish. Because of Christ's humility and his willingness to follow God's plan to the letter,